I thought I'd be dead by now. All kidding aside, I thought I'd be dead. I mean, I really was burning the candle at both ends. I was beating myself. Poison is a band that's been plagued by drama, controversy, and tragedy. And today we'll uncover the seemingly never-ending list of, at times, catastrophic challenges that the band has faced in their almost 40-year career. And at the end of this video, you'll learn the recent health challenges that have almost taken singer Brett Michaels' life on multiple occasions. You can't explain it, it just, the pain is like an elephant standing on your skull. But first, we need to talk about guitarist C.C. DeVille and the charges of plagiarism that have been made regarding some of Poison's biggest hits. In 2011, the songs Talk Dirty to Me, Fallen Angel, and Ride the Wind were the subject of a lawsuit by members of the now-defunct band Kid Rocker, who had claimed that the songs were based on Kid Rocker songs played to the Poison guitarist when he auditioned for the group, only a few months before he was to become a full-time member of Poison. Kid Rocker's attorney acknowledged that it took the duo quite some time, 27 years to be exact, to open their mouths about the so-called theft. Ultimately, a California federal judge ruled in Poison's favor, declaring on April the 8th of 2013 that the plaintiffs waited too long before suing the defendants for copyright infringement. This wasn't the only time the band was slapped with a copyright violation. Swedish glam band Easy Action previously filed a lawsuit against the rock legends, claiming that Poison had stolen the chorus of their song, We Go Rocking, for their 1987 hit, I Want Action. While mostly unknown outside of their home country, Easy Action may be familiar to some, as would-be Europe guitarist Key Marcello's band before he joined the final countdown hitmakers. In the end, Easy Action received an unspecified financial settlement for the alleged plagiarism in 1989. The band Poison began as natives of Pennsylvania, but the three members, Brett Michaels, Bobby Dahl, and Ricky Rocket, moved to Los Angeles in search of bigger things in the early 1980s. It was during an early round of auditions that the group auditioned guitarist C.C. DeVille for the role of lead guitar player, and although the three members were duly impressed with his playing and his image, they did not care for his brash New York personality. DeVille had reportedly dismissed the material written by the band, which he had been asked to learn for the audition, and clashed with Poison over which songs would encompass the audition itself. Michaels and Dahl, in particular, disliked the guitarist on a personal level and had strong misgivings about hiring him. Ultimately, in spite of their apprehension, the band decided that DeVille's talent and drive to succeed made him the best choice. It was also during this early audition process that Slash from Guns N' Roses also auditioned for the group and actually passed C.C. DeVille while walking into his audition as Slash was walking out. The Guns N' Roses guitarist has been famously quoted as saying that he had no interest in wearing makeup or dressing up like the other members of Poison and also had no interest in playing the music industry game and schmoozing in the way that they were prepared to do. The band proceeded with DeVille, and their performances soon became known for their party atmosphere and over-the-top glam image. Michaels was on record as saying that the band was the true event to go to, and that if you loved them, you showed up, and if you hated them, you showed up even earlier, because even on the smallest of stages, they made a big event out of it. The band's breakthrough debut album, the multi-platinum Look What the Cat Dragged In, was released in 1986, followed by Open Up and Say Ah in 1988. That release would be certified five times platinum in the United States and contained the singles Fallen Angel, Nothing But a Good Time, and the classic Every Rose Has Its Thorn. On the back of these singles, the band's popularity would skyrocket. But even from those early days, conflict pursued the band persistently. Brett Michaels, who had a habit for finding himself at the center of all sorts of violent altercations, became the subject of lawsuits in Atlanta, Los Angeles, and Tallahassee. One of those lawsuits came from Bryn Brittenthal, head of publicity at Geffen Records, who had filed a lawsuit against the band for drenching her with drinks and a bucket of ice at a music industry party. Speaking to Variety's Catherine Turman in 2019, the publicist recalled that Bobby Dahl was upset over a Hit Parader article where Guns N' Roses guitarist Slash, whose band that she had closely worked with, referred to Poison as posers. 
When she tried to pacify Dahl by telling him that Poison was outselling GNR at that point in their career, the bassist purportedly reacted by throwing a cup of beer in her face and placing it on her head. Later on, as she and a friend were leaving the party, a couple yeah. of members of Poison doused her with a tub of melted ice water. As reported by the Los Angeles Times in November of 1987, she had sued Poison for $1.1 million over the incident, claiming that she suffered both physical and emotional trauma in the weeks that followed. Not long after the fracas at the forum, the band was then slapped with a $45.5 million lawsuit by their former management company Sanctuary Music for breach of contract. The lawsuit had claimed that after a few hit singles, fame and fortune had gone to the band members' heads. At one particular concert in Greenville, South Carolina, the group had stormed off the stage screaming and yelling at the production crew for having not installed certain neon lights on the stage. The band members' personalities were made more noticeably volatile, in part, due to the drugs and alcohol that they had been ingesting with more increased frequency. Poison would later countersue, accusing the company of mismanagement of funds. Although the band's career was on a constant upward trajectory from their first album, the tensions that always existed between guitarist C.C. DeVille and the rest of the band would soon reach their breaking point. This situation was not helped by the fact that DeVille had for many years been battling drug and alcohol issues, and the final straw occurred during a disastrous live MTV Music Awards performance. The next day, the pair, after meeting once again at the elevator of their tour accommodation, went at it again, coming to blows in the lobby of the hotel where they were staying. What they didn't know at the time was that their performance at the MTV Awards that followed would ultimately be the undoing of the group. Before the performance at the awards show that night, during a short promotional segment with MTV's Julie Brown, it became clear that C.C. DeVille was already intoxicated, extolling viewers to vote and pointing wildly at the camera as he struggled to read his cues. C.C., we got Don Henley coming up, we got Chris, and the new power Jennifer Wilson. We got absolutely everything. After the break, we got Metallica, they're going to be performing live, and, and guess who's going to be here, shall we? I jump back and kill myself. The performance that followed would be an absolute mess. C.C. DeVille and the rest of the band took to the stage during a commercial break, with DeVille playing the riff to the previous year's hit, Unskinny Bop, before the show returned to the air. The band would soon join in, and the song was well underway by the time the broadcast resumed. Realizing they had begun their song before the show had returned from a commercial break, the group stopped the song midway through, causing a few moments of dead air and prompting Arsenio Hall to swiftly improvise an introduction. Well, <laughs> actually, actually, they need no introduction, right? I'll give them one anyway. Poison! But unfortunately, it only got worse from there. Determined to reignite the puzzled audience, Michaels asked if they're ready to talk dirty to me, triggering DeVille to begin playing the band's 1987 hit, rather than returning to the scheduled unskinny bop. The rest of the band would follow suit, but what transpired on screen became a sloppy and chaotic mess. And just when they thought it couldn't get any worse, DeVille's guitar actually became unplugged mid-song. This onstage calamity again culminated in another backstage fight between Michaels and DeVille, and DeVille would soon be fired afterwards. For DeVille, the next 10 years saw him in and out of drug rehab facilities, as well as appearing on a season of MTV's The Surreal Life. In 2006, after finally giving up drinking, he shared a story with the website Blabbermouth. In the story, he talked about driving in a blackout and hitting four parked cars. He totaled his car and the police found him crawling two blocks away. They gave him a DUI with an accident and hit and run, and the next day he checked himself into rehab. I thought I'd be dead by now. All kidding aside, I thought I'd be dead. And um, I just, don't ask me why, I just wasn't happy. I don't, in other words, you know, it's, you know, everything I wanted came true, yet I was still unhappy. DeVille would not be the only member of the group to have to deal with substance abuse issues. Bass player Bobby Dahl was also a wreck due to his alcohol abuse at the time. And during Poison's heyday, the musician was drinking alcohol in excess. In fact, if you watch the music video for Every Rose Has Its Thorn, Dahl is so inebriated that he has a hard time even staying upright. 
In fact, there's a scene in the video where you can see him wasted and fall down, and he's literally picked up by a guy who worked for him at the time. He would go on to tell the press that the scene was not faked, and that he was indeed drunk and wasted. In 1993, just like bandmate C.C. DeVille, Dahl checked himself into a substance abuse rehab facility. After C.C. DeVille was fired, the band would hire 21-year-old guitarist Richie Kotzen as the replacement, and he was highly regarded for his technical skill, bringing a fresh energy to the group while contributing to their 1993 album Native Tongue. However, what the band didn't know was that his time in the band would be short-lived due to a personal controversy that involved the band's drummer Ricky Rocket. It was after the group's first American tour with Kotzen as their new guitar player that the new recruit secretly found himself involved with Rocket's fiance of the time, Deanna Eve. After confessing his actions to Rocket, Rocket was understandably furious and the rest of the band members felt betrayed. This breach of trust would lead to him being fired from Poison in 1994 after just one album and one tour with the band. Unfortunately, his brief tenure would be marked by a scandal more than his musical contributions. Kotzen would go on to say how he was a kid when he was in the band and that it was a great experience, but now he's 21 and in a band that's already sold 20 million albums. He felt like everything was just like being in a movie. As for Ricky Rocket, he didn't realize that he would be facing a much greater crisis later on in his career. In 2015, after struggling with a persistent sore throat, Rocket would be diagnosed with oral cancer. After nine rounds of chemotherapy and 37 rounds of radiation, the cancer had spread into Rocket's lymph nodes, and he faced a difficult decision on what kind of treatment to pursue next when his chance of survival was less than 10%. 37 rounds of radiation, did the Herbitox, and I waited those three painful months to see if the cancer was gone. It had spread to the other side of the lymph node on the side of my tongue. So the options that I was given were chemo, buy me time, surgery, which would render me speechless, literally, or this new thing called... His tumor responded quickly, and just after two months into the trial, the poison drummer received news that it had shrunk over 90%, and after just 18 weeks, the cancer was completely gone. But when it comes to dealing with adversity, there was no one in poison who would have to deal with a lifetime of struggle like singer Brett Michaels. Apart from the never-ending list of health complications the singer would face, one of the most devastating times in his life was the grief he experienced due to the death of his best friend, James Kimo Mano, a security guard of the band and Vietnam veteran who had died after taking his own life. In fact, the song Something to Believe In was written as a tribute to his deceased friend. As for the singer's health battles, Michaels would be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at six years old and was often in and out of the hospital as a child. He famously had to take four insulin shots per day and check his glucose levels regularly. It would be at one particular concert in New Hampshire that the singer was rushed from the stage due to overly low insulin levels. Michaels would send out a message on social media apologizing for having to cancel the concert. As type 1 diabetes is a chronic condition with no cure, Michaels continued to deal with it. In 2010, his daughter Rain, 10 years old at the time, was diagnosed with pre-diabetes, and in 2018, the singer would tweet that he had been admitted to emergency rooms several times over the previous weeks because of diabetes-related kidney and heart issues. Michael's challenges with diabetes may have also attributed another disaster he would soon have to face in his life. That would be a car crash that could have ended it all in California in 1994. It would be late one night when the poison frontman crashed his Ferrari into a telephone pole while speeding at over 80 miles an hour on Riverside Drive in Burbank, California. The singer had been drinking and was following a girl home from the Rainbow Bar when the accident took place and thinking he was fine to drive but realizing too late that he wasn't. The car was completely totaled and the wreck was so severe it was hard to believe that anyone survived. Michael suffered a broken thumb, nose, chipped collarbone, cracked jaw, and he lost four teeth, but he was fortunate to be alive. At the time, though, Michaels would have little idea of the mountain of hardship that was awaiting him ahead. The first of many of these challenges the singer would have to overcome took place at the Tony Awards on Broadway. After performing their hit song Nothing But A Good Time as a tribute to the Rock of Ages musical, 
Michaels attempted to walk off the stage, only to be pummeled by a descending Broadway backdrop. The heavy signage knocked the singer flat out, and he suffered a fractured nose, needing three stitches in his lip. And I literally thought it was over. I thought, this is it. I'm dead, and that's what I woke up looking at. Michaels filed a suit against the Tony Awards and broadcaster CBS in 2011, alleging that in addition to the facial injuries he had suffered, he had to cancel several concerts and suffered from neurological issues. The legal matter would then be settled out of court. It would be April of 2010 that the iconic singer faced one of the scariest moments of his life when he suffered a life-threatening brain hemorrhage. While there wasn't a single incident that had caused it, the hemorrhage was likely the result of ongoing health issues that had been plaguing the singer in the months leading up to that day. You can't explain it. It just, it's the weirdest sound. If anyone's ever broken a bone and you hear a sound inside your body, when you hear that sound, it was instant. And it was instantly, instantly I knew something like it. The pain is like an elephant standing on your skull. That's what, that's what a brain bleed does. The pressure is what normally kills you eventually. And so I knew I was in trouble and my adrenaline and years and years of being diabetic through some horrific situations, it, immediately my adrenaline was on 10. I could barely speak. I knew I'd had some form of a stroke. Just weeks before the hemorrhage, Michaels had an emergency appendectomy. While recovering from that, he also formed a condition which essentially led to a hole in his heart that didn't close all the way the way that it should after birth. Many people with the condition never experience symptoms. It can increase the risk of stroke. And in Michael's case, the singer had suffered a warning stroke while watching television with his family one night, and that likely contributed to the hemorrhage that followed shortly thereafter. The singer could barely speak and knew that he'd had some form of stroke due to the drooping on one side of his face. He was rushed straight down to the emergency room, and they knew instantly and did the MRI. Those were three days of his life that he has absolutely no memory of. That's what, that's what a brain bleed does. The pressure is what normally kills you eventually. And so... Despite the severity of the situation, Brett Michaels would make a remarkable recovery. In January of 1997, Poison was not really in the news by that point anymore due to the death of hair metal and the ascendancy of alternative rock and grunge. However, Brett Michaels was still in a scary situation. MTV News reported that Brett Michaels had hired a private investigator to look into the reasons behind some increasing threats to his safety. Over the course of a few months in 1996, Michaels had commented that his Nashville home had been set on fire and he found that his dogs had been killed and all the lug nuts had been removed from a tire on his truck, causing it to fall out while going down the highway. Michaels believed that the reason behind these events was intimidation and revenge for his refusal to sell tapes that he'd once made with his now former girlfriend, Baywatch star Pamela Anderson. But nevertheless, in 1998, a company called Internet Entertainment Group commercially released a full video of footage of Michaels and Anderson's intimate encounters which it claims it obtained via a non-disclosed authorized source. Michaels never authorized the video, and according to his lawyer, he spent $100,000 trying to prevent the release of the tape, which may have been stolen and leaked by a former employee. I'm mean, Lee. I flipped out, so I start calling everybody. You know, everybody. I'm like, you know, I'm talking to Ricky Valentine. I'm screaming on the phone at him. I'm screaming at Ricky Rocket. I'm screaming at everybody I can get on the phone. I'm like, did you guys ever get this? copy it. After all of the insanity that the members have dealt with in their almost 40-year career, the four members of Poison still tour extensively, playing the hair metal hits to thousands of fans around the globe. If you enjoyed this video, take a look at the tragedy in the life of Eric Clapton. Also, be sure to leave a comment down below, like the video, and subscribe to the channel so you never miss another video from Project Hysteria. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.